Over the past few decades, we've witnessed the development of many great rivalries, including but not limited to Senna vs Prost, Boomers vs Millennials, and Sega vs Nintendo. For us nerdy types, few rivalries are as exciting as that between Intel and AMD. As with many rivalries throughout the ages, Intel and AMD were once allies. This alliance officially began in 1976, when Intel and AMD signed a cross-licensing agreement with each committing to share technical information with one another. In 1980, Intel was selected by IBM to supply the 8088 CPU in its upcoming 5150 personal computer, due for release in 1981. To satisfy a condition of the supply agreement with IBM, Intel needed a reliable second source for the 8088 CPU. By early 1982, Intel and AMD had formalised a 10-year agreement giving AMD rights as the official second source supplier of Intel's x86 family of microprocessors. This agreement was mutually beneficial. Intel received a licence fee for every x86 processor sold by AMD, and AMD did a brisk trade in supplying CPUs to the emerging IBM PC clone market throughout the 1980s. However, this relationship began to sour in 1984, when Intel refused to share details of its newly developed 8386 CPU with AMD. This triggered a wave of litigation spanning almost a decade, with the Supreme Court of California making a final judgement in AMD's favour in 1994. During this tumult, AMD had commenced a program of reverse engineering Intel's 8386 and later 8486 chips. AMD didn't set out to just match Intel's offerings, they wanted to exceed these offerings whilst matching or beating Intel's pricing. Intel's 386DX maxed out at 33 MHz, AMD's AM386DX maxed out at 40. Intel's 486DX maxed out at 33 MHz, AMD's AM486DX maxed out at 40 and was sold at a 20% discount to Intel's pricing. And whilst Intel and AMD went toe to toe with 486DX2 and DX4 clock speeds, AMD would sell you a DX4100 for around the same price that Intel was selling a DX266. Intel's response to this escalating 486 class pissing competition was the Pentium. Introduced in 1993, the Pentium brought with it dual integer pipelines, a faster floating point unit, a wider data bus, separate code and data caches, and features for further reduced address calculation latency, also while maintaining backward compatibility with the x86 family. This move caught AMD unawares, thus putting them on the back foot in the CPU arms race. Whilst eventually responding to the Pentium with the K5 in early 1996, AMD was under immense pressure from both the architectural step change imposed by Intel, as well as a nascent threat from upstart microprocessor manufacturer Cyrix who was looking for a piece of the burgeoning IBM PC clone market through the agency of its cheap, and perhaps sometimes nasty, 486 clones and its derivatives. AMD had little choice but to go back to doing what they did best, taking a well-established CPU architecture and bettering it. Enter the AM5x86. Released in November 1995, being just three months prior to the K5, the AMD looked, on paper, to be too little too late. However, it quickly found favour with users looking to upgrade their existing 486 system without the added expense of a new Pentium-compatible Socket 7 motherboard. The AM5x86 also became a staple of entry-level beige box PC clones throughout the mid to late 90s, until production ended in 1999. This is the first PC that I assembled myself. I bought the parts in 1996 and selected the AM5X86133 due to a combination of A. Not having the funds to buy a Pentium at the time, B. Being impressed by AMD's earlier 386 class CPUs, and C. Reports suggesting that a well sorted AM5X86133 system could outperform a more expensive Pentium 75 equipped rig. After mothballing this machine in 1999, it's followed me across two subsequent house moves. 
The last time I fired this machine up was shortly after I moved into my current digs. Since then it's been sitting in my garage, cycling through about a decade of cold damp winters and hot dry summers. Conventional wisdom suggests that an old computer stored for a significant period of time, especially in such variable conditions, will need a good clean and a recap before even attempting to start it up. But I'm neither conventional nor wise. What I'm planning on doing is seeing if this will start up without doing anything to it other than adding a few bare essentials. A keyboard, a ton of cables, and a mouse pad. I'll get that later. Before I connect everything up, a quick visual inspection of the ports might help. Oh dear. Cuba time lapse. So the moment of truth, will this work? Well, the monitor works. Um, I know that because I was using it this morning with my laptop. A little bit scared now. What's happening over here then? Can't smell anything bad. Should it be making that noise? Doesn't sound healthy to me. Right, well, that was unexpected, but then I didn't know what to expect. So what I might do now is I might fire it up just with the basics. Electricery, keyboard, mouse, monitor. I think I've caught something off this, um, but it's not zombie apocalypse. It's probably just good old fashioned tetanus. It's not making that horrible noise anymore, so that's a result. And I'm actually thinking, looking at the CD light and the hard drive light, I suspect the IDE interface has lost its marble somewhere. Let's take a look in here and see what's what. Oh, there's several dead bugs of no particular description. Is that mouse poo? Gee, I wonder if the batteries let go. Those ISO slots shouldn't be the same colour as the battery, should they? Although, because this was uh, sitting vertically, this may not affect the, uh, the I.O. unless the tracks are completely shagged. Well, Nelly, check out those cobwebs. I might get a really good view of them uh, when I pull out that sound blaster. Fun fact, just a few weeks ago I discovered there's a difference between Phillips head screws and JIS screws. It's possible that I may have been using the wrong screwdrivers for all these years. Should invest in a set of JIS screwdrivers. Ooh, that shouldn't be that colour, should it? A 3Com card. Now I know for a fact I got about 8 of these in a job lot at an auction back in maybe 2002. So I'm quietly confident that even if this one's cactus, um, it's not going to be the end of the world. Well, I know the lighting's not exactly balls, but you can see the extent of the damage just here. Like, you notice, particularly around here, it's all green. It's not great. I reckon there's even a bit of corrosion around that BIOS chip, so that's probably not helping anybody either. Now that I've removed all the former residents of corrosion land, will this fire up? I guess there's only one way to find out. I'm not optimistic, but let's try this anyway. Bear in mind, I did absolutely nothing to try and diagnose the IDE issue that I identified. Maybe we could try that.
That was a new noise. Not a great noise, but a new noise. And now there's only one disc related light staring at me. So, result? I might have a spare BIOS chip because I'm thinking that might be the go- or even maybe I should just try taking out the existing BIOS chip and giving that a jolly good clean. Let's see how that goes. Now bear in mind I have no idea what's happened to my chip remover. I, I had one somewhere once upon a time but I'm not sure what I've done with it so I'm going to have to improvise. Feel free to start downvoting this now because you're probably going to be triggered by this if you have any sort of electronic sympathy whatsoever. I don't know how important that crystal is adjoining the uh, BIOS chip, but I guess we'll soon find out. Well, here we go. It's almost as if this was designed for some sort of dodginess. I'm only going to make this worse. But hey, the worse I make it, the more content there is. Yeah. And uh, I think for that, I deserve an award. Okay, so this is just good old vinegar. Uh, who was, I, was, I can't remember who it was that was using this. I mean, I could, I could pretty much give a shout out to every single channel that I've ever watched. Um, but yeah, vinegar yeah, works reasonably well for this sort of thing. Uh, there we go. That's going to need a little bit more brushing. Um, now, I probably should disconnect that battery, but at the same time, I'm thinking that horse may have bolted. So, I think my best plan of attack might be to try and save my Olivetti and my Alpha before they too become cursed. So, again, I'll probably do that off camera because you can see everyone knows how to disconnect the battery. It's not that difficult. If I can manage it without screwing it up too badly, then I think anybody can. So, let's see what's going on here. I reckon this is going to be a full board out operation. I don't think I'm going to be able to do much in situ. Uh, I'll see what I can... Hang on, is that meant to be like that? What the... F is that? Let's have a look. Um, did I do that? Uh, it shouldn't be like that. Good news there is that whilst the um, uh, that battery's eaten through the lacquer, it doesn't look like it's broken any any of the tracks so I may try resuscitating this board I may not while I do that I might just see what I can do about these things here about um well that's not that's not so bad the um network card that's not that might almost be salvageable this network card might have been saved if you look there it doesn't look terrible in fact it looks like I might I may have just saved that so you know, on the plus side, you know, the 3Com Ethernet cards, they're a classic for a reason. They just work. They do a great job. Uh, drivers for Windows, Linux, pretty much anything you can imagine. Uh, yeah, so there's a reason why the old 3Com cards of the 90s are so legendary. So let me just have a look. Is that 10100? It's an Etherlink 3. Um, I don't remember if that's 10100. Even if it's only like 10 base T or whatever, it's... Um, you know, good enough to get you online. This creative sound card certainly cleaned up all right as well. We see that the um, ISIS slot uh, doesn't appear to have been damaged by all that horrible battery leakage. And on the back also looks relatively tidy, so I think we got away with that one. Um, notice it's an OR card. I think it's an OR32 or OR64. I forget. I'll have to look that up. A good 16-bit ISIS sound card is always a handy thing to have. Right, now that BIOS chip slot hasn't actually dried yet, but because I'm a bit of a pelican and I'm expecting this isn't even going to work anyway, I might as well just jam this in and see what happens. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Probably should use the uh, tweezers or whatever, but um, let's keep my sex life out of it. 1990s jokes. It's period correct jokes for this computer. So before you get all woke in the comments, I'm just being period correct. Alrighty. Now, I guarantee that's not going to work. 